Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first talk for today. We're introducing today uh, Jude and Alan, which show us uh, interesting things which you can do with uh, ZFS. So, let's go. Microphone, that would help. <laughs> yes, so my name's Alan Jude, and I'm a FreeBSD developer, and I've been working as a FreeBSD sysadmin for about 13 years now, uh, and I got involved with ZFS in 2011 uh, for my video streaming company to store a large quantity of video. And uh, I also do uh, two weekly podcasts, uh, one about BSD and one about being a sysadmin, and uh, have contributed various bits and pieces to FreeBSD and ZFS. Well, yeah, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me, and um, Benedikt Reuschling is my name, and I will be uh, speaking with, together with Alan Jew today about ZFS. So my background is more in academia, and uh, I'm using ZFS on a big data cluster at our computer science department in Germany here, and um, I'm also involved in the FreeBSD project. I mentor people into the documentation project that we have. People like Alan Jude are welcome additions to our team, and... Um, I'm also a member of the board of directors of the FreeBSD Foundation, who not also supports the FreeBSD project, but also sponsors uh, ZFS developer summits. And we thought this would be a good venue to show you what ZFS can do. Uh, so who here has, uh, is familiar with ZFS already? Okay. okay. So we'll do a good. kind of a brief overview to kind of get you up to speed if you're not that familiar with it. Uh, so it's a pooled storage system, so rather than your typical uh, having to use a volume manager to take your multiple disks in an array and make them appear as one logical disk so that you can put a file system on it, because most file systems can only understand one disk, uh, ZFS allows you to take a number of disks and then abstracts the file system from it. So it's an integrated volume manager and file system so that the free space of each of your file systems is actually shared from the pool. So instead of having to decide that this file system will be this percentage of your available space and this file system will be the rest by partitioning, you create as many file systems as you want and they all share the free space uh, and use it up as they need and you can expand it by just adding more disks and the space is available immediately. You don't have to try to resize your logical volume or resize the file systems. Uh, it also supports, it was designed to do away with the idea of file systems having limits. You know, if you've been doing this long enough, you remember when you couldn't have a file bigger than four gigabytes on a file system, or when you, you know, every file system that exists now has some maximum size that we could probably reach within a couple of years. But uh, ZFS so uses 128-bit pointers, uh, so it can handle up to 256 zettabytes, which is... 256 million petabytes, or 256 million million gigabytes. Uh, so it won't run out of the ability to expand. Uh, with current technology, having enough hard drives to actually fill a ZFS pool would, the amount of energy required would boil all the water and all the oceans on the planet. <laughs> so you're not going to make it too big at this point. Um, it also supports uh, its own version of RAID, uh, with distributed parity in three different flavors, RAID Z1, which is similar to RAID 5, but with distributed parity, and Z2, again, similar to RAID 6, with distributed parity, but it can actually do triple parity RAID as well. Uh, now that hard drives are so big, you can get, you know, 6 or 10 or 12 terabyte hard drives, the time it takes to resilver from a drive failing can be so long that the chance of another drive failing is high enough that you could actually lose the, the, the RAID array. And so by having triple parity, uh, you know, some study from a university in Israel found that without triple parity, there's no way to guarantee uh, 99, or five nines of uptime without uh, having at least triple parity. Uh, so a little bit about the history. It was originally started at Sun about 15 years ago. Uh, and just over 10 years ago, it became production ready and they open sourced it. Uh, and it's been going since then. Uh, when Oracle acquired Sun, they closed sourced their version of it uh, and went off in their own direction. 
and the OpenZFS project was founded and has continued development uh, for Illumos, which is a fork of OpenSolaris, but it's also since been ported to FreeBSD in 2008, and then there's the uh, ZFS on Linux project from Lawrence Livermore National Labs in the US that has ported it to Linux. And uh, the purpose of the OpenZFS project is to make sure those three different ports of it maintain uh, compatibility between each other. So you can actually export a pool from a Solaris machine and import it on a Linux machine and the file system just works. Uh, like the entire RAID array, you can just move it. If you've ever tried to move a RAID array between two different hardware RAID cards, you know how big of a deal that is. <laughs> um, and one of the ironic things is that uh, ZFS, uh, the proprietary ZFS from Oracle is only just recently got one of the first, fe first features that was available in the uh, open source version that was maintained after Oracle closed their source uh, about four years ago, which was the transparent compression using a new compression algorithm, or a newer, a faster compression algorithm called LZ4. So it's interesting to watch there be a proprietary fork, but it has less features than the open source version, where it's usually the other way around. You know, it's like pay extra and you get these features on top of the open source one. But more work has gone into the open source one than the proprietary one since the split. Oh, and there's also a port to Mac OS X if you have a Mac. <laughs> So like I said, it combines the concept of the file system and the volume manager. Uh, what makes a big difference here is that now the file system actually realizes that it's using more than one disk, and it can optimize its I.O. to actually saturate all of those disks. Uh, and it doesn't, you're not having to fool the file system by presenting one big logical volume from your RAID manager or something to pretend to just be one disk. Uh, but one of the major other things about ZFS is that it does checksumming. So every time you write data to the disk, it calculates a checksum and stores that in its metadata along with the file. And when it reads it, it checks that uh, checksum. And if it's not the same, then it will use the RAID parity or your mirrors or whatever redundancy you have to restore the data. Or if not, it will return a read error. Any other file system, if the disk has just gone bad and, and is returning incorrect data or bit rot or a flipped bit or whatever, the file system won't detect that and you'll just get back bad data. You can imagine having a database and you're reading from it and a bit gets flipped and all of a sudden this user's not an admin anymore or is an admin when there shouldn't be uh, and you probably don't want that to happen. Or uh, It's not in this set of slides but another one I show what happens to a JPEG if you flip one bit in the middle of the JPEG and all of a sudden you're, you know, family photo is ruined. Uh, it also has, like I mentioned, transparent compression. So as you write data into the buffer to be written to the disk, it can be compressed. And that way, when you write it to the disk, it takes up less space. Uh, but that's not the only advantage to it, especially in a database where you have a lot of text-based information that compresses well. It can increase your throughput to writing to the disk. Right, your standard hard drive can only do 100 or 150 megabytes a second, but if you have data that compresses two to one, all of a sudden you can write 300 megabytes of data to the disk in one second. So you can actually lower the latency of your database by compression. But the application doesn't have to know that that's happening, right? It's all transparent inside the file system. And there are a selection of different algorithms you can use so you can trade off the space versus how much compression you get. Uh, but it also has a feature called early abort, so that uh, if you write a file, like a tar file that's already compressed, uh, it will realize this and just write it uncompressed instead of spinning the CPU trying to compress you know, an un uncompressible video file or something like that. Um, the big difference is that once you don't have separate file systems anymore that are, you know, when you don't have to create partitions for each file system, where you're statically allocating the amount of space, it allows you to create a much larger number of file systems and through that be able to tune each one in a different way. So ZFS maintains a set of properties on each file system that you can tweak. So you can turn compression on and off for each individual file system and create as many file systems as you need to tune your workload the right way. You can also adjust things like the block size. So for example, uh, because ZFS is copy on write, you also get snapshots for free. So you can take a snapshot of a data set at any time, and you have 
exactly how that data set looked at the second you took the snapshot, but you can keep writing and maintain both versions with the space, not with it doubling the amount of space you're using. Um, and it has a delegation system, which we'll talk about later, so that you can allow certain operations to be done by non-root users uh, at your discretion. So yeah, um, that was a good overview. We're now going to uh, show a little bit about how it's actually implemented or more like how the actual architecture is. So um, on the right side here, we have the old world, the traditional file systems with a storage manager or a proprietary software RAID or something, like your um, LVM comes to mind or your software RAID that you have on your operating system or also a proprietary hardware card that does RAID for you. So in that model we have um, a couple of disks that can be combined into a volume, but uh, as you are system admins you probably all know this, once you set up the system and by that time during the install you already have to decide how big each individual partition has to be. So you have to decide, oh, this is my home directory or the home directories for the users that are going to be on it later, or and, uh, var should have this size, or user has a couple of gigabytes. But you have to do it uh, at the beginning of your install. And the problem is, you notice probably uh, during the runtime of the system, uh, you figure out, oh, I should have put more uh, gigabytes into var because there's a lot of log files going on. Um, with ZFS, you don't have to do the initial partitioning. ZFS does use a different approach using um, data sets. So in ZFS, all disks that you combine into a storage pool, a Z pool, um, they all share their complete storage capacity to the uh, uh, ZFS data sets that are on top of that. And that way you can decide later on um, that a specific data set should have um, a specific quota or a reservation, but uh, all the data sets that you create, like a user data set or var data set or a home data set, all of these data sets share the complete storage that your disks provide. And you don't have to decide upfront which partition sizes you are going to assign, and you can do that during the runtime of the system. That's very flexible. And also, it gives you things like uh, snapshots and clones and uh, compression for free, basically. Some vendors charge you extra for these features, but on ZFS, it's everything available in one big package, and it's free, and you can use that basically right away. And by activating certain features as properties on these data sets, you can decide, okay, this data set should have compression, or that other data set should have a uh, couple of snapshots for um, the benefit of having the ability to roll back to a certain state of the file system. So yeah, that's already a big difference between a traditional storage um, a system and what ZFS provides. Okay, the next one, thanks. Uh, ZFS is also very focused on data integrity, keeping your data safe and providing you with the actual original data like 15 years after you store that data um, in the same state that it was when it was stored. So some long-term archival systems have the problem of you store uh, like a certain data set on it or a certain data amount and after 10 years or 20 years um, you read it again and during that read there are some errors encountered because there were bit flips or cosmic rays caused some changes in the magnetic uh, storage and um, your then with, faced with the problem of how can I recover these files. ZFS uses uh, checksumming and uh, different levels of redundancy, like uh, rate levels, to ensure that the data is not only consistent, but it can also detect errors that are happening using bit flips. And um, when that happens, ZFS has the ability to restore these um, damaged blocks on the disk and uh, heal itself. We'll have a short example later on how this works. So um, this is a view of the old way. So probably most of you know this already. You have your storage array. Uh, let's say we have a small mirror here with two disks. And one day you read a couple of blocks from the disk or your application does that. And um, there's a corrupt block for whatever reason. Maybe the disk is dying or there are some uh, 
uh, changes that got unnoticed. So one of the disks is faulty and the other one is working properly. The problem with that is um, usually <laughs> um, Murphy's Law, it's going to be the, the read is going to happen from the disk that is the damaged one and the corrupt block gets sent up to the application and the application will throw errors. I cannot read the database or a file corrupt or something and users uh, wonder and scratch their heads or US system administrators sit there and try to figure out what, where the error in the application is while the actual error is down at the actual uh, storage uh, device. The, the worst case is that the application actually makes a decision based on the incorrect data and does the wrong thing. Yeah, rather might, than actually telling you that something went wrong. Exactly. So it might process that uh, damaged data and stores it again, and then you have a real mess going on. So in ZFS, uh, we have the same situation, or could have the same situation. You have a damaged disk. That happens all the time, uh, unfortunately. But ZFS has the ability to not only detect that, but also correct it. Uh, so ZFS, when every, each block that is written, it stores a, a checksum beside the block and validates itself against the blocks that are on top of that and below it in the ZFS uh, tree. Um, that way it can validate that it's still properly uh, stored on the disk. Um, so let's say we have a, a checksum error. So what ZFS is able to do then, it goes to the mirror partner, the other disk, and checks its set checksum. And when it detects that the other checksum is the correct one, then it does two things. One, it sends the correct data up to the application so that the application can read it and process it accordingly. But it also has the ability to heal the damaged disks by correcting the checksum on the disk one, that's uh, not the proper one, by copying its own checksum to the mirror partner. So that way both uh, disks still have the original uh, checksum from the file you originally saved. So if your disk is dying, uh, ZFS has the ability to, for a couple of um, moments or for a, a time, to correct the first disk. But you still need to uh, figure out whether the disk is dying and replace it. But uh, in opposite to the example on the previous slide, it doesn't give the uh, damaged data up to the application. So the application will always get correct data from ZFS uh, if you have enough redundancy. So ZFS is very powerful in that keeping your data safe in the long term and providing you with the actual data that you originally stored. Yeah. Uh, it also keeps a set of error counters so you can actually see if a disk is, is throwing checksum errors or having read and write errors. So it, uh, unlike a hardware raid which will try to hide those errors from you until it's too late, it will make sure that you're actually the errors are passed all the way up to the operating system from the hardware so that you can keep track of them. Yeah. Because there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. You might have faulty cables or your uh, firmware driver of your RAID card is uh, having some issues. There's or a lot SSD. of... SSD. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. SSDs are still a little bit uh, faulty or prone to errors. So there's a lot of stuff that could go wrong in the whole IO chain coming from uh, your DRAM down to your actual storage media. Um, so, to, in order to help you detect those and correct them, ZFS keeps snapshots, as I told you. Um, but ZFS doesn't have a concept of file system check, so no FSCK that you need to run. Uh, if you run the, FS the file system is, because it's copy on write, the file system is always consistent. Either the change happened or it didn't, and so there's never a need for uh, a file system check. Right, yeah. So imagine you're um, running a file system check on a multi-terabyte storage array that takes a lot of time. Uh, ZFS does it basically in the background using a different approach called scrub. So what it does is a periodic check that you can set yourself um, in intervals that you can define. And scrubs basically go through each block and check the checksum whether this is still the correct one. And if it isn't correct, then it will try its self-healing capabilities to um, use the mirror partner or your um, RAID Z to uh, reconstruct the proper checksum and copy it to the damaged ones. Um, you can run uh, ZFS scrubs uh, during off hours, um, but it doesn't take your storage offline. You can still access and read and write from it while the checksum uh, calculation is running. And the scrub is basically a bit um, 
you know, CPU hungry by Not doing really. all these uh, checksum calculations, but it's still better to have the storage available while the checksum uh, operation is running. Right. So every read is checksum when you read it and make sure it's not uh, corrupted. But if you have data you're storing long term and you don't read very frequently, the scrub is basically a patrol read that goes through and, and checks that files that you aren't accessing frequently are still intact as well. Because if you detect the bit flip sooner, it, less chance that it'll happen on both disks and you won't have the ability to recover the data. So uh, Alan already mentioned the copy and write uh, capabilities of ZFS. So ZFS will never store the same block uh, again. On the, so let's say you have an editor open or an application writes something to a log file. All the new writes will not go into that original file or the original block on disk, but to a separate one, uh, which is the copy and write feature. So in this example, we always start from a consistent state and move the file system to another consistent state by, let's say, you're doing some writes over there, your application writes data, or your logging system, or your uh, archival storage. So the blue blocks are the ones that are being um, changed at the moment. And that change causes uh, metadata to be written, and uh, this will cause this tree to be updated. But it will never overwrite the uh, yellow or orange ones, because it's copy and write, it will never um, break or overwrite your current uh, blocks. That way, when your power goes out, you will never have an inconsistent state of the file system, because either the change has happened or it has not happened yet. And once all these metadata writes have happened, then a new version of this uh, ZFS tree is going to be written, and that way you can have uh, a consistent file system state each time. Right, it moves from consistent state to consistent state. If it gets cut off in the middle, it just basically roll back the transaction, like in a database. Yeah, um, what this gives us uh, as an added bonus is uh, snapshots, uh, very cheap snapshots, because they don't require that much operations, because you already do it basically in the background without knowing. So um, you probably know snapshots that you can have an image of your current state of the file system. Uh, ZFS supports millions of snapshots. Uh, there's actually no limit that you could reach in a, a yeah. certain amount of time. Uh, you can basically do snapshots every second if you're so inclined, but it will only uh, store the actual differences between the first snapshot and the state that the snapshot has um, that when you take it. So using that model, um, Let's say I change some files here, the metadata gets updated and it writes the Uber block. If you're taking a snapshot, that old copy isn't thrown away or being recycled, but it's kept because that's your actual snapshot. And if you take the next one, the next version of this file system tree is being kept. But ZFS only stores the actual delta between those files. So if there weren't many changes between those two uh, versions, then it doesn't take much disk space. But if there were a lot of disk space changes, then the snapshot will grow. Yeah. So um, here's a first example of how to create snapshot with CFS commands. You immediately see that CFS is very um, you know, simple to use because it only has like two uh, programs that you need to run or um, commands that you need to know, ZFS and ZPool. Uh, so ZFS, the first one, this one lists our current uh, ZFS data sets that we have. So I have a, a pool called Tank, and um, un, under that one there's a data set called Home, and I want to uh, make a snapshot of that home directory because that's where all my important users are. Um, so the, you can see the backup uh, one that I uh, named it. Um, the add basically separates the uh, data set, the snapshot name from the data set. And you see the used capacity is zero because there weren't any changes between that snapshot and the previous one. Um, you already see also that uh, on the available column, the whole storage array um, gives the whole um, storage to all data sets that you have on your pool. And so now I'm making some changes. Maybe a user stores some files in there, or you're doing uh, backups, or whatever um, workload that you have on your uh, array. And now you take a, a second snapshot, because you want to uh, save that state. 
And now when you look at the ZFS list output, you can see that uh, only the, the changes that were happened between the first snapshot and the second one were recorded in, in this column, in 27 megabytes in this case. Your mileage may vary, but it's only um, the 27 or the actual difference between your last snapshot and the first one, not the full um, 31 gigabytes or 984 that we have here. Yeah, so in the end, you end up with three complete copies of your 31 gigabytes of data in the different states that you can access at any time, but you've only consumed an extra 27 megabytes of space to have all three copies of that. So yeah, let's say disaster happens, you have a bad day, it's Monday morning, you had not copy yet, and um, your tab key is broken basically, and you do an RMRF, um, and if you're not careful, your tab key broke, and uh, it doesn't expand home anymore, you only wanted to delete one user, um, and then uh, suddenly you realize, oh, my uh, home directories are all gone, and suddenly two things happen. You start to panic, and your phone starts to ring because users are missing their home directories and the files in there. Um, but ZFS to the rescue, uh, you do regular snapshots. And that way, you can uh, save the day by basically rolling back to the last known state where the RM, RF didn't happen. And that way, you can quickly restore your data. CFS rollback is super fast. It takes a couple of seconds. Yep. And um, you can answer the phone and say, hey, I already fixed the issue. And now I'm getting some coffee. Um, so it's a very simple command. Just type CFS rollback and then the snapshot name you want to roll back to. And it will go, go back to that uh, snapshot date or the state that the file system was in during that when the snapshot was taken. Right, so uh, talking a bit more about the compression features that are built in. Uh, so you can basically, as the data is being written uh, into the ZFS buffer, uh, it can be compressed if it's being written to a data set that where you've enabled compression. And then when it, it gets written to disk, uh, so you can end up with a higher throughput than you would normally get because you've compressed a large amount of data into a smaller amount and you can write it faster than would be possible to write the original amount. But you also get that back when you read. So you know, if you read the 100 megabytes of compressed data and it expands to 200 megabytes, you've just read twice as much per second as well. Uh, and it's automatically done transparent to the application, so the application doesn't have to know about it. And then there's a selection of different uh, compression algorithms, but the newer LZ4 is recommended for almost everything because even on a, a laptop processor, it can compress uh, both 1.5 gigabytes per second per core. So in, unless you're writing more than that on your laptop, which is probably doubtful, you're not going to saturate your CPU with the compression. Uh, and then for decompression, it can do over four gigabytes per second per core. Again, on a modest two point something gigahertz laptop with only two cores, you know, you put it on a, a Xeon with 32 cores and you're going to be able to more than keep up with your disks. Uh, but as I mentioned, it also has the early abort feature. So it realizes when it's trying to compress something that's uncompressible or where the compression gain is not going to be enough to offset the CPU cost, and it will skip compression on that file and write, or that block and write it uncompressed. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the data sets that Benedict works with is called Movie Lens. It's basically ratings uh, for every movie ever or something mm -hmm. similar to that. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so it's a, a large data set, but it's mostly textual data. And so it compresses quite well. So in this case, we will uh, set it up and create data sets and compare the different compression settings. So in this case, I will create a new data set and set the compression option to gzip, and then create a second one where I've turned compression off. And then we write the, uh, or we can take a look and we can see that we have one where the compression is set to gzip and one where it's off. And currently, our compression ratio is one to one because we haven't written any data yet. But now, we copy all the movie lens data into these two data sets. And now we see that on the one with compression turned off, our compression ratio is again one to one. But on the where we've enabled gzip, we now have stored that data 5.37 times more efficiently. And so, in the end, we used 673 megabytes of space instead of 3.52 gigabytes. 
And you can get compression of that magnitude from most databases as well. Uh, and then there's inheritance. So uh, because you can create data sets that are ch children of other data sets and on down very deep, you don't want to have to manage all these settings on each individual data set. So there's inheritance. If we create a separate data set called backup under gzip, it automatically inherits the setting from its parent, although you can still override it locally if you want. So this gives the administrator the ability to really define how they want the whole tree. So you can easily turn compression on for everything at the root of your tree and then just decide to disable it for one specific workload on one specific data set. And then if you want to restore the setting, if you use the inherit command and tell it which property, it will then take the property from its parent instead of erasing whatever local setting you might have set. Yeah, another feature is deduplication. Um, so we're storing more and more data each day and ZFS has the capability of checking whether you are storing multiple copies of your data on your uh, zpool. Um, how do they do that? Um, relatively easy because they already keep a checksum of each block that you're storing and ZFS deduplication is uh, block level based. So what they do is they check each incoming block and when you activate the duplication and if that block checksum matches another block then that block gets replaced by a pointer which is a couple of bytes in length. So that way you can store or uh, save a lot of disk space by just um, referencing blocks that are already there with other blocks. So imagine you're storing a couple of um, like research files that we do at our university and each user copies uh, that original research data set into their home directory. Um, each one basically blows up the storage because um, everyone copies the same data uh, into his own uh, directories. But with ZFS deduplication available, um, it can detect that this is a multiple uh, of the original block that are stored on the array and then it just replaces those with links to the um, original data set which saves a lot of space. Uh, we have a short example here um, on the next slide which shows this. So can you switch that one? Yeah, thanks. So in this example um, we show a couple of um, information about our zpool, the name, uh, it's called the movie lens because that's our current project and the size, the allocation and the free space. And there's also a column here that tells you uh, the DDAP ratio, which is uh, the column to the right here. And now we're looking at um, how much space our movie lens original has. So it's like um, 673 megabytes at the moment. That's well, what that's, that's the compressed version. Used. So you can actually dedupe the compressed version. Yeah, and combine those double two. the win. Yeah. So in this example, we have like uh, three users uh, and each one copies that original data set into his own home directory or in his work uh, directory. And um, once that's done, ZFS, when uh, it activated the deduplication, it is able to detect, oh, it has three copies of that original data set already because the checksums match. And that way we uh, achieve a deduplication ratio of three. And you can see in the allocation column that um, no additional disk space was used because only a couple of uh, bytes were used for the link to the other copies of the file system or the, the actual file system blocks. And uh, the other interesting thing is this also meant you avoided doing those writes to disk. So your disk throughput and bandwidth was saved for this and so this copy operation was faster than it would have been normally and uh, it left the bandwidth available to other applications uh, on your system. Yeah. And so it, it, does, works, yeah. it works very well for virtual machines. You know, if you have a large array of virtual machines stored on your ZFS pool, you know, they all have the same blocks for the operating system. You know, at least some share of most of your virtual machines is going to be the same because usually you run the same operating system on most of them. Yeah, um, so as cool as deduplication might be, you have to be careful because uh, all these comparisons of the checksum have to be stored somewhere. And ZFS is already um, hungry for memory. You uh, should give ZFS as much memory as you can, but also should leave some space for your operating system and your actual other applications that are running. Um, so ZFS, when you activate the deduplication, you also have to store the actual deduplication table, DDT, into main memory because it has to make these comparisons of all these checksums. Uh, 
Um, that's why uh, it's going to be a bit difficult to recommend deduplication. Uh, there might be workloads that uh, are well worth it because they are used multiple times on the same storage array, um, but also comes up with the benefit or with the drawback that you have to give it additional um, memory to process these uh, references in the DDAP table. Well, in particular, basically, it's a giant list of SHA-256 hashes for each block, and so when a new write comes in, it has to be compared against the whole list. If the list doesn't fit in RAM and has to go to disk, then you have to read the whole thing off disk every time you want to do a write, and your performance will plummet. But yeah. uh, as long as you have enough RAM to keep the table in memory, it won't be an issue. Uh, you need about four gigabytes of RAM per terabyte of storage that you want to dedupe, uh, but it can really depend on your block size. Uh, you'll get better dedupe if you use a smaller block size, like four or eight kilobytes, uh, but that means there's that many more hashes for the same amount of storage. Whereas if you use larger blocks, uh, you'll only get the dedupe uh, win from having, uh, if that whole block is the same, but you'll have fewer blocks and it'll take less memory. Yeah. So remember earlier, we, I told you that there are basically two commands that you have to know, ZFS and ZPool. That was actually a lie. Uh, there is a third command, but most users should not touch that one because it's the <laughs> ZFS uh, debugger, ZDB. And that one can simulate uh, the deduplication gains that you might have for a given uh, data set. So you uh, are unsure whether you want to activate deduplication or not because of the uh, memory, uh, the additional memory needs, uh, then ZFS has the ability to simulate the actual deduplication gains for a certain uh, storage pool that you can give it. And um, in this case, it calculates that it would not be beneficial to activate deduplication on this pool because there aren't that many copies available. It uses that using uh, the ref counts of the actual um, checksums that it calculated from the blocks. Um, but there are other workloads or situations where you have a lot of um, copies um, multiple, store, multiple times on your storage array, and in these cases, uh, deduplication is um, very beneficial for you. So we initially um, were excited by that feature, but um, we recommend nowadays to first activate compression and then check out whether deduplication is beneficial to you. Because yeah. there, were always, uh, there are always gains with using uh, compression, but deduplication is kind of a two-edged sword. Yeah, there's uh, some ongoing work to uh, make the deduplication table smarter to be able to handle the situation where your list of hashes is outgrowing your amount of memory, uh, but that's still ongoing work. Uh, so one of the more important things with ZFS is the ability to actually delegate uh, commands to users so that you don't have to do as much of the work as the storage administrator, but also you have to protect yourselves from the users because once you give them the ability to do things, they will do things they shouldn't do. <laughs> uh, so in this particular case, uh, we want to give a user the ability to manage their own snapshots. Right? So we create a separate data set for each user for their home directory and we can delegate to them with ZFS allow. So we allow the user Alice to create snapshots and roll back those snapshots on their data set, but their data set only. Uh, and then if we do the ZFS allow command, it shows us what they're allowed to do. So now this user would be able to take snapshots uh, of the home directory before they do something that might uh, mess up their data where they might want to rewind, uh, and then they have the ability to do the rollback themselves as well. But they can't touch any other data sets. Uh, and so you can see here, if we switch to the user Alice and run the command, then we can see that they've created the snapshot. But, you know, Snapshots have a cost, and um, if you have thousands and thousands of them, when you try to run the ZFS list command, it'll be slower. Uh, and so you can enforce a limit on how many snapshots a user is allowed to have, so they can't basically do a denial of service against your system by just creating snapshots in a loop. Uh, and so we've limited the number of snapshots Alice can create, and if they try to create too many, then they get the permission denied error. So you can uh, limit the number of file systems or the number of snapshots that can be created uh, as children of a certain data set. So when you delegate permission to it, you can still have the limit. Uh, the interesting thing is there's actually delegation uh, of those permissions as well, or inheritance of the delegated permissions. So if you give the user the ability to create a data set under their home directory, to create a second 
file system where they can have different settings, uh, then it automatically inherits the permissions they had uh, on the parent. But you can also set uh, basically a sticky bit uh, type of permissions so that rather than inheriting the permissions from the parent, they will get certain permissions uh, only if they were the one that created the data set. Uh, so I have an example here. So uh, we want to allow Alice to create and mount new data sets on her home directory, but we don't want to allow Alice to actually destroy her home directory. But by creating this create time permission of destroy, it means that Alice will gain the ability to destroy any data set she creates, but not actually gain the ability to destroy her home directory data set. Right, so only the data set she creates can she get rid of, but her other permissions, like the ability to create new data sets and mounts, are automatically inherited. So when she creates a new data set, she'll have the ability to destroy that, but also inherit the ability to create and mount children of that new data set. And so you can see, with that system, you can easily delegate the permissions and create stuff. Um, another example is you could create a data set uh, called projects or something, and every user would have the ability to create new data sets in there, but only the person who created the data set would be able to destroy it. Or you can also delegate to groups instead. So this would allow you to create a data set where all users have permissions to read stuff from every project, but only the project leader on each project can uh, you know, create or destroy data sets and, or manage the snapshots or whatever you wanted to allow. Uh, the other thing ZFS has is integration with the container system. So on Solaris with zones and on FreeBSD with jails, you can actually delegate a data set into the container. So now root in that container has full access to that data set as if it was their own pool. And so they can do whatever commands they want inside there and create more data sets and change the mount points and, and set any properties they want. But it automatically protects, the, or, uh, makes it so that data set cannot be used on the host system. So that, you know, the, a malicious user in a container creates a new data set and sets the mount point to slash etc. If that ever got mounted on your host system, that would replace your password file with the one they've chosen, and now they could SSH in and, and root your system or whatever. Uh, so it has built-in support for dealing with containers and also isolating those data sets so that they're not accessible from the host system in such a way that they could be used as an attack vector. Uh, it doesn't work on Linux yet because there's no, with C groups and so on, they don't actually have the concept of a container, just a namespace for a specific application. So it doesn't quite work yet, but there's ongoing work to have something of this nature work on Linux as well. But it becomes a, a big deal when you can delegate a data set, a completely separate file system for the container to have, but you can set a quota on it so they can only use so much space. Or you can uh, allow them to create as many sub-file systems as they, they require, but you can also, again, the limit on the number of file systems or snapshots they can create is automatically set up for you. Yeah, so once you've delegated the permission into the container, root in there has complete control over that sub data set, except for the ability to override the quotas that you set for them on the amount of space or the number of file systems or snapshots. Yeah, ZFS also has another feature called serialization. So you can serialize all your storage um, to another system. So what it can do is you can say, send this data set snapshot over the network or to another pool on your local system and receive it there and store it as being a copy of the original pool. So you can have uh, standby systems by periodically sending your snapshots over to a secondary system. And when that first original system breaks or is not available anymore, you can uh, fire up the second system without uh, worrying that the file systems are not in sync. Yeah. Uh, so basically it can take uh, a snapshot and which is all the blocks and serialize it into a stream and send it over a pipe. Uh, it's completely one way, so it doesn't require any communication back from the other side. So you don't actually have to receive it at that time. You can do a ZFS send, serialize the data and write it to a tape and maybe decide to restore it a couple of years from now. Or you could pipe it directly into ZFS receive, 
and recreate that file system on the same machine or another machine over the network or whatever you want to do. Uh, and it also supports incremental uh, snapshots as well. So you can send only the difference between one snapshot and a second snapshot. Right. So we have an example here. We uh, have two pools in this case. Uh, our primary pool, which is called tank. You can give it any name you want. It's just a very common example here. And you have a backup pool that stores all your backup from the original pool. And uh, when we list our snapshots using CFS list dash T snapshot, it only lists our snapshots. And we see that uh, Tank has a snapshot name called backup1. Normally, you would give it a more uh, descriptive, descriptive name, like a date or uh, some specifics uh, that are internal to your um, project or your storage. Um, and then you can say ZFS sent and uh, use that snapshot name. And it writes uh, into the pipe. And ZFS receives on the other side, reads from that pipe, and stores it in your backup pool. Um, but since you can use a pipe, you can also pipe it into SSH and move that data set uh, to another file or to another host. And that's nice having this replication over an encryption so that people aren't able to read on the wire and see what kind of data you're transmitting no. um, because SSH provides the whole encryption layer. Uh, and you can also do incremental backup, so you don't have to send everything uh, over the wire each time. Um, since CFS has the ability to detect what are the differences between each snapshot, it only sends those differences over the wire. So and if there aren't many differences, then it, the transmission isn't going to be very long. Yeah, um, the big difference over something like rsync, where you're going to stat each file in your, you know, walk the entire directory tree, stat each file, see if the timestamps match, and if not, have to check some each block of the files until you find the differences and then send a delta. ZFS, uh, because it's already doing the copy on write, in its metadata, it knows for each block on the disk when that block was last updated. And so when you ask it to do a uh, incremental replication, it basically finds every block that's been modified between the start time and the end time, uh, the dates of those two snapshots, and then just sends those over the pipe. And because it's all one way, it doesn't have to worry about communication with the other side, so it writes to the pipe as fast as it can. And so it can easily saturate a 10 gigabit uh, network uplink as long as your disks can keep up. So the replication is very, very fast and designed to basically saturate your network or your disks, whichever runs out of bandwidth first. Uh, so it, you know, when you compare it to running rsync over a data set of 10 terabytes, it can take, you know, if you only have a couple of gigabytes of changes, ZFS will finish in a few seconds, whereas rsync is going to take 12 or more hours just because it has to stat through all the files, especially if there are a lot of small files. So, you know, that slows rsync down even more but ZFS isn't looking at the files. It's only looking at the blocks on the, on the disk. And so it doesn't matter if it's one really large file or a bunch of small files. It goes at full speed either way. Yeah, that's the example um, for the incremental snapshot. But what you can also do, since CFS is, uh, or OpenCFS is a, an open system, and you can uh, rely on it and look inside it. It's not a proprietary thing where you have to call the vendor if there's something going wrong. Um, you can look inside all these streams. So in this example, we have a, a demo snapshot. And then we make some changes to a text file, open source data center conference.txt. And then we create a separate snapshot after that. So now we have only our text file in as a delta between those two snapshots. And there is a um, a uh, flag called uh, dash i to CFS send, which tells CFS to incrementally send the snapshot, only the differences. Yeah, so we're only sending the blocks that have changed between that A snapshot we created and the B snapshot, and that should only be our echo to the one file. Yeah, and we send it to a local file called diff.zsend, because we want to look inside to see whether everything is in there that we are uh, expecting. And there is uh, yet another command called zstreamdump, which has uh, been written to debug these ZFS streams. Uh, and in this case, we pipe our um, difference into it. And after um, some header files, which tells you um, basically when this uh, snapshot was created and the difference between those and the pools that are involved, uh, it can give you a hex dump, which contains our original OSTC string. So you already can inspect what data are going to be transmitted.
Yeah. And uh, it actually internally is using uh, globally unique IDs for the snapshots. So if you end up with two snapshots that have the same name, but would have different contents, it will detect that and do the right thing instead of you know, getting very confused because, oh, you already have that snapshot, but it's actually different. Uh, so before we get into uh, more of the, some of the upcoming features that are being added to ZFS, does anybody have any questions? We know it's a lot of stuff, but um, it's very exciting just having all these features in one file system, and you probably will look at other file systems uh, and say, oh, they don't have that many features like that CFS has. Because mm -hmm. uh, one of the other features it has is uh, what's called a ZVOL, and basically, uh, instead of creating a file system, you can actually create a virtual block device that's just backed by the pooled storage. Uh, and those are very great for uh, exporting as iSCSI targets or for creating as backing for virtual machines. Uh, ZFS also has integration with NFS to share uh, data sets over NFS v3 or v4, full ACLs, and everything else you might want to do. No questions? Yes. Hi. Um, does it support some kind of? No, it's on. It works. Okay. Uh, some kind of shrinking my pool storage, or let's say, yeah, I have too many storages in my in my pool, and I want to get rid of some um, HDDs. Yeah. So if you used uh, mirror sets to do this. Uh, or anything you striped together, then uh, a new feature which is available upstream but will land in OpenZFS probably in the next three or four months is VDEV removal. So uh, when you add groups of hard drives to your pool, they're called virtual devices or VDEVs. Uh, if it's a mirror or a stripe, you'll be able to remove it uh, now. But, what, uh, but if it's a RAID transform, you won't be able to because internally the RAID transforms don't actually know where the blocks start and end because of the variable size and distributed parity. Uh, so if you use mirror sets or stripes, then yes, you will be able to actually shrink the pool. Uh, but if you're using RAID Z, you will not be able to. All right. So some of the other features, uh, one of the ones that just landed is those replication streams. Because it's, you're writing to a pipe and it's only one way, um, if the pipe gets interrupted, you know, you're doing a connection over SSH and it gets interrupted, uh, previously you had to start the replication over because on the sender side they had no way of knowing what the, if the receiver was even receiving it, right? Because it was a one-way pipe so you could write it to a tape and not receive it until five years later. It obviously can't wait for the receive part. <laughs> um, and so they invented a system to allow you to resume basically on the receiving side you set an extra flag and it will keep the partial data instead of throwing it away when the uh, stream is interrupted and then it sets a new property, which is this cookie. Uh, and you take that cookie from the receiving system and give it to the sending system as the, an extra parameter to the send command, and it contains the data of which block, how far through the replication stream you were, it, it, which data set you were sending, which snapshots, and how far through the replication you were, so it can fast forward and just resume from that spot. So that was a, a big enhancement, and that's available today in OpenZFS, starting with FreeBSD 10.3. Uh, it also has the replication record checksum. Uh, previously, when there wasn't the ability to resume, uh, ZFS uh, send stream was one checksum at the very end across the entire set of data, uh, which obviously wouldn't work if you allowed resuming. Uh, so they split it up so that each individual record is checksummed as it's uh, being received. And if a checksum doesn't match, it interrupts uh, the receive stream, and then you can just resume it and deal with, you know, why your network was corrupting your stream as you were sending it. Uh, and again, that's available today. There's also, uh, they found that while the send command was very optimized and would saturate your network, oftentimes the receive command wasn't keeping your hard drives as busy as it could. Uh, and so they've a new prefetch feature there where it fetches the metadata it's going to need to update to receive uh, and basically uses a queue to dispatch more work at once and, and improve the performance of the replication. Uh, one of the upcoming features is um, ZFS has what's called the adaptive replacement cache. Uh, 
So uh, in memory, when it's doing its file system cache, instead of a regular LRU like you would see with mo you know, the buffer cache on most operating systems, on ZFS, the ARC actually maintains two separate parts of the cache. One is for most frequently used files, and then another one for most recently used, similar to the LRU. Uh, the importance of this is if you do some operation like a table scan on a database or a backup of your system where you go through and read every single file, an LRU type cache is going to just keep rolling over because you're inserting new data and not reading a file a second time during a backup. So with ZFS's ARC, you have the most frequently used cache that's not going to get blown away by this large scan operation but it's actually four lists because it keeps a, a blacklist or a ghost list for both the most frequently used and recently used. It remembers which files were in the cache but kept falling out and basically blacklists them to allow some other data to have a chance to get into the cache where it might actually get used enough to remain in the cache. Uh, and the new feature is that if, you're going, if the data that's coming in is going to be written to the disk compressed because you've enabled that setting, it will actually compress it in RAM and keep the cached copy compressed and will decompress it as it's used again. Uh, and so that with this, you can actually, especially with databases, keep more of your working set in your RAM uh, and get much better performance. Uh, this was built by a company called Delphix that does a database virtualization appliance. And they had uh, a, data set, a database that was of 1.2 terabytes uh, but the system they had to run it only had 768 gigs of RAM because that was the most that the motherboard would support. Uh, and they were basically stuck at a, a performance bottleneck because SSDs weren't fast enough for their workload. And so with this compression feature, they managed to compress that 1.2 terabyte of database to 460 gigabytes. And so now it all fits in RAM with lots of room to grow in their 768 gigs. And so this more than tripled their performance in their database by just keeping, you know, when you read a compressed block off the disk, you keep it compressed in the cache and RAM and only decompress it as it's accessed. There's a small cache of, I think, 256 megabytes for blocks. You know, if you're reading the same block really rapidly, you won't decompress it multiple times. But like I said, because LZ4 can decompress at four gigabytes per second per core on any modest machine, you know, it, the decompressing the block that's stored in RAM is not going to be a bottleneck. Uh, another one is there's the L2 arc. So, the, oops, sorry. Oh, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Alan wrote a book. Just, <laughs> yes. <laughs> not uh, just one. And I also <laughs> wrote uh, a book on ZFS if you're interested in learning uh, more on how to use it. It's at zfsbook.com. Um, questions? Still some final questions? <sighs> I thought we were short, not long. <laughs> um, what do you think about Ubuntu releasing the ZFS on Linux directly within its distribution channels? Yeah, uh, we do, we've been doing this in FreeBSD since 2008, but our license isn't in conflict. Uh, as a ZFS person, I'm all for it. You know, the more ZFS is awesome and everybody should get to use it. Uh, as a FreeBSD developer, it's like, well, I prefer to keep it as a FreeBSD feature and not let Linux have it. But in the end, I think ZFS is too good to deny all of Linux access to it. Uh, but I'm not a lawyer. Uh, that question will be settled someday and hopefully come out with the right answer. Because it gives you the benefit of, uh, you know, with the ZFS send feature to transfer not only your pools, but also between operating system. And it, ZFS is intelligent enough to also make uh, use of the different uh, NDNS. So if you're sending from a little NDN to a big NDN system, it can automatically transform those and vice versa. So it'll be really interesting to see the ability to pull the hard drives out of a Linux server and put them in a FreeBSD ARM64 server and import the pool and the file system still works. Any further questions? Did you have a question? Yeah. Would you say it's safe to run it on Linux? So all the deduplication and uh, other features like compression? Uh, so the, the question was if it's safe to run on Linux. Uh, the actual core ZFS code is shared between all the operating systems. Is uh, The only things that are specific to Linux is what's called the Solaris porting layer, 
which is you know a bit of code that adapts the code that was originally for Solaris and makes it work in Linux because you know the Linux kernel has different primitives for a couple of things. Uh, so the core ZFS features are very stable. The integration with Linux is apparently production ready now. Uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs in the US, which is a big government research lab, has been using it for more than five years and it's been fine for them. Uh, I've personally not used it, so I don't know. But I've been using the ZFS and FreeBSD in production since 2011 and had no problems. Any final question though? Okay, um, thanks Benedict, yeah. thanks Al. Thanks for having us. Yes.